In the modern airliner cockpit, you'll see automation everywhere you look. From the flight management computer, to the autopilot's mode control panel, to even the adjustment of the seats. So how did we get here? What's the point of all this automation? And are the children of the magenta coming for my TCS button? All of this, coming up. Forty years ago, this is what a standard airliner cockpit looked like. While this is one of the most modern cockpits, they're actually from the very same model of plane. A Boeing 737-100 and a 737 MAX 8. I want to compare and contrast the two, because there's a lot going on. But if we compartmentalise it down, we can discover what all this automation is doing creeping into the cockpit. We'll start with the most important six instruments in the cockpit. The trusty old six-pack. The airspeed indicator, artificial horizon, altimeter, vertical speed indicator, horizontal situation indicator, and the turn coordinator. These are the six primary flight instruments that pilots use to fly the plane. They are critical. As such, they take up the prime real estate in front of the pilot's eyes. But as superhuman as they'll tell you they are, pilots can't see everything at once. So they continuously scan their eyes across the instruments to acquire the information they need. Fundamentally, the six instruments are powered by gyros, electromagnetic force, or pneumatic pressure. So when one of them fails, as analog instruments tend to do, there are backups scattered throughout the flight deck. If we shift to the new age version of the Boeing 737, the MAX, we can see that all this fundamental information is still there, in vaguely the same position. But it's all integrated onto a shiny LCD screen. This means less scanning of information is required, and it can be perceived more accurately, since it's displayed in a higher level of detail. While the data, coming through the computers and onto the screens, can self-check through its levels of redundancy before it gets passed on to the pilots. To the modern eye, across the centre of the panel appears to be an abundance of gauges scattered almost randomly. But the engine instruments are arranged like this for good reason. The Boeing 737 was one of the first jets to eliminate the need for a flight engineer. All the switches and instruments that were once on their panel needed to be relocated somewhere in the pilot's view. The result was clearly a lot of information compressed into a relatively small space. To allow for this, most of the gauges are actually quite small, difficult to read, and even harder to make a precise perception quickly. On the contrast, the Boeing 737 MAX displays the engine instruments on a central screen. The best thing about a screen is its customizability. The aircraft can show the most appropriate information at the most appropriate time. This is also where ECAS is being introduced, coming with the newest MAXs, allowing even more information, such as cautions and warnings and their checklists, to be presented to the crew. Conveniently, below the engine instruments are the engine controls. There's a lot going on here as well, but nothing much has changed between the original 737 and the MAX. Nothing much has changed on the radio stack either, giving the pilots the tools to tune, identify, transmit, and switch radio frequencies can only be simplified so much. Up on the glare shield is where we see the most change, however, and it's where most of the automation has been introduced. The autopilot, the automatic flight control system, the flight control computer, whatever you call it, they all do the same thing. They fly the plane for you. Back in the 1960s, when the original Boeing 737 came out, the autopilot couldn't have been more basic. The glare shield contained three panels, just one of which controlled the autopilot. The Sperry SP-77 could maintain a heading and track a localizer or VOR, but it couldn't do much vertically other than maintain an altitude. Pilots didn't use it as much more than a fancy wings leveler. The 737 MAX couldn't be more different. The glare shield is scattered with autopilot modes and selection windows. Its autopilot can basically do everything a human can do, and it can do it just as good, if not better. Shooting ILSs, flying go-arounds, and even landing itself if the conditions are right. The real magic comes when it pairs with the flight management system, however. It didn't exist at all in the original 7.3, but the MAX couldn't get off the ground without it. 
It's the brains of the aircraft, with a massive database of routes, waypoints, and approaches. They can be fed straight to the autopilot to fly, and be displayed on the MFD for the pilots. When you think about it, killing two birds with one stone. Decreasing workload for pilots, but building their situational awareness. Both extremely important factors for modern day pilots. Situational awareness is the process where a pilot perceives, processes, and then predicts outcomes based on given information. It's aided by having brain space to work with when workload is low. The greater the gap between the pilot's actual workload and the max available workload, the more room they have for situational awareness. And importantly, the ability to deal with an unexpected task or failure. This is all getting confusing, so let's take an example. Say Bob is flying on a day when everyone else is on the ground. He's flying through thunderstorms producing uncomfortable turbulence, extreme icing, and frightening lightning. Back in the original 737, he's also hand flying the aircraft, working the radios, and picking a route through the weather all at once. Even for the most ace of pilots, this level of workload would be approaching their breaking point. If something else was to come along, as simple as a minor electrical failure, or as complex as an engine failure, this could be all it takes for him to be pushed past his limit, Bob losing SA, and potentially making unsafe decisions. Now, let's take poor old Bob and put him in a shiny new Boeing 737 MAX. Let's engage the autopilot for him, and bring up the weather radar on the MFD. We might even be lucky enough to have Wi-Fi, and an EFB for even more awareness. His workload has already decreased, and the higher level of SA not only allows him to deal with the current situation, but predict future events as well, with a substantial amount of available capacity. Good on ya, Bob. Seeing just how much this next-gen automation makes a difference, it's clear that automation isn't taking over the cockpit, it's already here, but not to replace the pilots. It's simply making them the best they can be. Because modern accidents and incidents don't happen when pilots' workloads are down here, they happen when they're up here. Complex and unpredictable failure scenarios can't be resolved by a computer, and they can't be resolved by an overloaded pilot. They can be managed when both are put together. Think about if a computer was to deal with the multitude of failures with QF-32 or US 1549. Or if a pilot was to deal with them with no automation, there'd be no high level thinking or superb management. But by combining the human and the computer, we make both as effective as possible. So while it could be seen that the automation is making the pilot irrelevant, it's actually making them as effective as ever.